Hey, what's up everybody? Uh, Gabe here, and today I'm going to talk to you about this 1987 Kawasaki KLR650. This is my 1987 Kawasaki KLR650, and it's the bike I've owned for the longest. I've had this thing for five years now, a little more than five years, like five years and four months or something like that. Uh, I, it's never been plated legally for the road since the whole time I've owned it. It's been mostly sitting in a barn for those five years to be honest it did run five years ago when i parked it in that barn and uh i'll tell you guys the story about how i ended up with it and we're going to kind of go over its condition so i bought this bike this was my first real foray into dual sporting um when when i first started riding i was only interested in street bikes in the first two years you know that's what i focused on i got street bikes a couple of them and then I had this buddy who had a farm, uh, you know, 45 minutes about away from where I lived, the guy I worked with. And he, uh, he was kind of interested in motorbikes after, uh, you know, after him and I um, got to talking and stuff. And he wanted this kind of bike, a dual sport, because, you know, on his farm, he could like ride it around and practice and like learn to ride, um, you know, where, like at his place. So he found this old dr650 for pretty cheap but it needed some work it was before it could pass an inspection so I thought that was pretty cool considering how little he paid for it so i ended up finding um this thing for like i think it was eight or nine hundred dollars it's been five years i don't exactly remember but i remember it being right around that thousand dollars canadian mark and it was in running condition but again it, it wouldn't have passed inspection in the state it was in so it wouldn't have been legal to plate i would have had to do some work on it but that was okay so I rode it around a bit, my buddy's farm, but quickly occurred to me that I didn't really like this bike too much. And this is a lesson that I should have learned with this bike. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, but basically this is a tall, wide, heavy machine. Pretty sure that wet, this thing weighs about 460 something pounds. The seat height isn't crazy high, especially when you compare it to my Sierra 450. I think it's like 35 inches, but the thing is, it's 35 inches, but look how wide the seat is. If you compare this width to the, the 450, it's a lot wider. It's a lot harder to get your feet on the ground. And of course it's very top heavy because this is a big gas tank and it holds a lot of gas when it's full. So also, I mean, you know, everything about it's pretty iron age. Let's be real. That's okay. Um, so I got this thing. I quickly realized that for off-road riding, you know, I wasn't really in love with it. And for street riding, I already had a sport bike. This wasn't going to, you know, do anything special. So. I decided that what I would do is um, look to spend maybe a little bit more but get like a dual sport I would like better and I ended up getting a DRZ 400 which I had for several years and I really liked um, and so this thing kind of became the neglected child because well now I have the DRZ so who cares about this KLR so it sat in the barn for years and I was happy to forget about it. Cue this weekend my friend called me the, the barn owner called me he's been living out of the country for a while working somewhere else but he kept his place here and uh he called me and said listen i'm thinking about selling the place do you want to come get your bike and now that i have a house it was like okay so i rented a u-haul bike trailer and i went to collect this thing yesterday and now we're looking at it in the cold light well it's hot today but the broad clear light of day to see you know how bad it really is so let's go over that let's go over what it would take to put this thing back on the road and uh, what I'm thinking about in those regards. So let's start with the obvious. The battery is completely shot, obviously. The gas tank has gas in it that is older than the five years that I've had it because I never put gas in it. I just took whatever the previous owner had left in there. <laughs> so it's at least five years old, maybe more. Um, that means our friend here, the carb, absolutely needs to be cleaned out. And you know, a, a rebuild kit's $45. And I think at this age, this bike is 35 years old. I don't think that would hurt it. Uh, you know, the, there's some like surface junk on this bike, but it's not too rusty. There's a little crap, a little pitting there, but you know, that's not too bad. I could take this piece off and repaint it or something. I, I don't know. Um, same here. It's not it's not too gross for that. Um, the, the frame's got little dings on it, but nothing major. Uh, there's oil in it, although it looks like it's low, but I don't care because, again, it's not like the motor's going to start anytime soon. These are, these have to go. These are the worst foot pegs I've ever seen. Uh, they inspire zero confidence. This is one of the things I hated about riding this bike. Ah, that reminds me. The clutch is shot. 
I don't know if it's just the springs, but when I got this bike, the clutch pull was super, super hard. It's still quite bad. And there's a, a, if you feel it, a point where it engages very difficultly. So we thought the obvious, oh, the cable is kinked. So we'll replace it. So I, I, I replaced the clutch cable five years ago. It's one of the few things I did to this bike. So it's like a brand, well, brand new. It's five years old now, but never used clutch cable in there. Um, lubricated properly and everything. And it's still, it's still crap. So it's not the cable. It's either the springs, but there's, it's probably the springs even, but I'm not opening up the clutch and the gasket and all that crap without doing the whole clutch so this bike needs a new clutch the chain and sprockets are worn not crazy i've seen worse on the sprockets honestly it's not that bad but uh the chain is super old it's been sitting it's it's probably seized up in a bunch of spots i'm gonna i'm gonna replace it and the sprockets at the same time this bike doesn't need fancy aluminum in the middle steel on the outside you know modern cool sprockets i'm gonna put the cheapest steel sprockets you've ever seen on here because why wouldn't you it's a klr uh i mentioned the gas oh yes one of the other big problems this bike has is the fork seals are leaking and that was a big problem for transport actually there's a spot on the tire here that you should be able to see that's soaked that's fork oil because that was the part of the tire that was down when it was in the trailer and because the forks were compressed by the trailer every time i hit a bump which around here there are plenty it would pee a little oil everywhere and i had to clean out the trailer before i returned to u-haul all this is wet like this is nasty of course these tires are done um i'm trying to figure out what tires they are actually they say duro on them but i couldn't i couldn't see much else um two ply nylon they're 21 inch obviously um made in taiwan i'm looking for that year code which should be the the week and the the year and the week of the year that they were made, but I can't I can't seem to see it. Maybe it's on the other side, but these are very old and uh, not very good. And I'm gonna replace them for sure. I'm not gonna put anything expensive on there. Maybe some some Ken does. I was thinking some like 70% street or 80% street. These are Trackmasters on the back. So these are Kenda Trackmasters. These are K760s. They're a bit more aggressive than I would put. This tire might be a little newer than the front, honestly. But uh, I still don't, I can't seem to find the date code on it. Maybe it's hidden by the swing arm. Ah, anyway, I'm gonna change the tubes and the tires and honestly, probably the rim tape under there because it's gonna be nasty. The rear shock spring looks kind of gross, but not that bad. So maybe I'm gonna try to leave it and see. Obviously every fluid in this bike, gas, oil, coolant, brake fluid, it all has to go. Uh, when I change the gas out of the tank, I'm gonna have to clean the inside of the tank because God knows what kind of crap is accumulated in there. Um, other than that, oh yeah, it doesn't have any indicators on it, front or rear, and it doesn't have any mirrors at all, although I just slot in some here. Um, that's one of those problems though where like, you know, new mirrors and new indicators are kind of expensive. So I'm gonna try to find the cheapest ones. It has a, I don't know if it's visible in the camera, but it has an awesome old guy's rule sticker on it. Um, and it's apparently been to Grand Canyon National Park and Death Valley National Park. So this bike's got some miles on it. It does have a Quebec sticker from an inspection from 2015. So in 2015, this thing was legal. It had been inspected, but since 2015, I bought it in 2017. So two years later, it had no, um, it had no, uh, no inspection anymore. Cause the mirror, when I bought it, there was no mirrors. There was no indicators. There was no way this thing would have passed. So I'm going to need to do that. There's definitely been some electrical modifications. I don't know what these switches are for, but there's switches here. There's a 12 volt outlet for like a cigarette style outlet that clearly wasn't stock. I can see some like, aftermarket fuses and crap down there uh, there's some extra leads which may be for the indicators but they're a little weird looking so i don't know the har the wiring harness is probably not going to be in amazing condition and i think i mentioned it before but if i didn't it obviously needs a new battery because this one is done so i did some brief calculation using the fort nine website and using the cheapest parts i could find for it and i forgot about mirrors but i did include cheap blinkers and it came up to like 850 Canadian for the stuff, minus the, the fluids. So I didn't include the cost of brake fluid, oil, 
because I have some of that stuff and, and even a fork oil I have some because I did originally intend to, to fix the I knew about the forks so I didn't originally intend to fix them and I'm pretty sure I have seals and oil somewhere but seals are really cheap so I did include them in my shopping list and uh, yeah the uh, the the cost of this thing came out to be about eight hundred fifty dollars let's let's throw away the the eight hundred to a thousand dollars i spent five years ago Let's just pretend that that money is long gone and assume that i wanted to sell this thing i wonder if i could sell it again for a thousand dollars if i put a thousand dollars of parts into it and just break even because i don't think i could sell it now i don't think i could give it away easily now the problem with this bike is it is so old that it's hard to transfer the ownership of it so quickly when when you sell a vehicle in Quebec used and you transfer the ownership you still pay the buyer I should say pays a provincial sales tax on it now we can get into the politics of that or we won't because I, I really don't want to I don't I don't like want to talk about that but every every time a vehicle is resold when it's sold new you pay a federal and provincial tax and then every subsequent selling will pay the provincial tax again now what would happen for a long time is they would basically use the price on the bill of sale so you sell this bike to a guy for two thousand bucks and in theory you write a bill of sale for two thousand bucks and you bring that with you when you do the transfer and they charge you you know nine point whatever percent of two thousand bucks that's your sales tax but of course people were very obviously quickly realized that they could just write i sold the bike for a hundred dollars on on their bill of sale right there were an awful lot of one dollar sales going around so obviously they figured out what was happening and they cracked down and the way they did it was basically to use they're not using the kelly blue book but they're using some thing like that that uses very very basic metrics like the year and the model i don't think they take even mileage into account and uh, and that's it and your your tax value is based on that which means if you're buying a pristine example of an old machine with very low mileage you're getting a really good rate and if you're buying an old clapped like a clapped out version of something that's still kind of valuable you're getting a very bad rate but it averages out is the theory the problem is this bike is so old 87 is so old that they don't have a value for it in their book so the what you then need to do is you're forced to bring it to a licensed evaluator basically who last time I did it in 2017 charged me $100. He did thankfully not need to have the actual bike. He, he was okay to do it from pictures, but of course he looked at the pictures for 10 seconds and he looked at me and he said, how much do you want me to write on the paper? So in the end, we're back to the original system of just making shit up on the bill of sale, but it cost me $100 and I had to go out of my way. So that's annoying. Um, so to even give this bike away requires that and you know maybe some of them want to see the bike in person so i figure i'm gonna probably get it running again get it you know platable and running and then at least if i want to sell it at least it can ride itself to an evaluation and at a thousand or whatever dollars it'll be more worth even then though i don't know i don't know if it'll ever be worth like around a thousand dollars so this is my killer um i'm gonna probably rebuild it also just for the project so i have something to do in the winter um, there's some jobs I've never done before, like the fork seals I've never done before. This bike would be a really good bike to practice doing a valve check on before I do it to my nice CRF 450. So maybe I will do a valve check on this bike as well. I'm sure it's never had one before, or if it has, it's been an awfully long time. Uh, I never mentioned it, but it has, according to this odometer at least, it is 54,572.2 kilometers on the clock, 259 on trip A, whatever that means. I don't know how this thing works. I assume that you play with this guy. Oh God, I can I can increase the mileage. Oh, that's stupid. Okay, so that's probably not good. Um, I don't know how accurate that is if I was just able to do that by twisting that knob. Uh, it has a stainless steel, I thought this was fun, a stainless steel braided brake hose, which is eating this rubber boot to hell, but is awfully sophisticated for a KLR 650. Oh, uh, this brake fluid container is pretty bad. I bet the master cylinder is shot. Uh, there's a lot of things that I'm going to discover are wrong with this bike as I work on it. And that's what I worry about is that this, what I've estimated to be a sub thousand dollar project is going to turn into a $2,000 project by the time I'm done um, doing everything that needs to be done to it. So that's a little, a little worrying, but I don't know. I don't know what else I could really do. So, yep, that's where we're at um maybe there'll be some build videos don't expect like a nice regular episode build series i don't want to spend all the money at once on this thing i don't want to do all the crap at once on this thing i'm going to put it back in my garage now and forget about it for a little while 
I was kind of tempted to put in my garden shed, not even my garage because it takes up space that I wanted to use for other stuff. But for now, it'll go in the garage. We'll see what happens to it before the winter. Um, so that's it. That's the 1987 KLR 650. Um, it might feature again on this channel when I work on it. We'll see. So thanks for watching. And uh, I'm about to leave for my BDR trip very soon. So there probably won't be another video until after that. So uh, for those following, um, I'll see you on the other side of that. So have a nice one. Peace.